They're inevitably going to come those challenging times. But if I can help a man be a little bit more resilient and come out the other side of these challenging circumstances unscathed, then I feel like we're doing work worthwhile. You see the way pop culture influences our kids. What's my role as a father giving a different perspective to my children? If you're complaining about it, show me what you're doing about it. Well, I'm busy. Okay, then you don't care about it. Stop complaining if you're not going to do anything about it. Ryan, welcome to Battleground, man. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, what's up, brother? It's great to see you. I'm excited to... Oh, I'm excited you launched the podcast and then excited <laughs> to be on the on the show as well. Man, I have to tell you, this, uh, this world is dizzying. There's a lot to learn. I feel like just buying all the equipment and testing it and making sure everything functions properly, especially when, you know... I. I used to fashion myself as a tech savvy guy, but now things change so fast. Things are evolving faster than I can keep up. But I'm really, really grateful for your help and your mentorship on on this project. And, you know, really, Ryan, what so I went back and listened to your very first podcast oh, in prep for in prep for this interview. And I realized a lot of things uh after having listened to that. But but you, you are now, I would say, one of the f- foremost experts on what it means to be a man, the role and the importance of fathers in the lives of children, uh, but especially boys, uh, what it means to be a good man, a good spouse. And you talked about that mission in your very first episode yeah, and clearly articulated what you were setting out to do. And how now that you are a father and had your own children, um, you realize that there is a void in this country um, and, and that and that maybe you I think you even went so far as to say there's an assault on what it means to be a man in this country. And so I think as a result, Ryan, you know, we've had, you know, something like I think we have like something like from 12 year olds to 40 and maybe even beyond of, of men, boys and men who have no idea really what it means to be a man. But the order of man in, in your book, the Masculine Manifesto, I think has helped provide some clarity there. I but I hope so. I mean, I look just to set the record straight. I I appreciate the compliment, but I am not an expert on this stuff. You know, <laughs> I have I have my fair share, if not more so, of of struggles and internal battles and the way I show up in my relationships. So I, I want to be really clear. I, I don't want to put myself ahead of anybody or or pretend that I have more figured out personally than I do. In many ways, I feel like over the past eight years, I've learned a lot of stuff that has made me improve my life as a man. Uh, and then also, there's a lot of things in my life where I've realized, you know, even though I talk about these issues and I'm intimately familiar with what we as men need to be doing in our lives to improve our situation and the lives of the people around us, that I'm not great at implementing that stuff. So I can see how challenging it is if somebody like myself, again, not putting myself out ahead of anybody, but somebody who's poured his, his, his time and attention and energy, thousands and thousands of hours and, and energy into this, still falling into the same traps that I often warn others about. It's very uh, interesting, to put it mildly. Well, what I find remarkable about you and, and your story, um, I, you know, you're an Iraq combat veteran, you're, you're, you're a veteran like me, um, but how listening to all the things that you went through as a kid and you're very open about this and not having a permanent fatherhood presence in your life right. as a kid and how that has affected you, uh, not just affected you, but what I what I think is extraordinarily powerful and I think positive about your life's experience. And I'm sure there's a lot of negative shit, too. Don't get me wrong. Um but you've been able to take that pain and channel it into something that is – channel it into a movement. And, and to me, it seems like you've almost said, you know, look, I went through all of this stuff and now I'm going to do everything that I can to make sure other boys and other men who might have a similar experience learn something from me and maybe, maybe live a more powerful life driven with purpose. Yeah. I mean, look, I talk with men every day who are struggling with some of the most difficult things you can imagine from losing a loved one 
Uh, maybe that's some sort of voluntary type separation or the death of a loved one to, to, to medical conditions, to mental illness, to suicide and, and deep, deep clinical depression. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's sad to see that so many men are going through this. And, and I'm not sure that we can totally eliminate the, the fact that we do have to go through these issues. But if I can help men be a little bit more resilient during those times, uh, they're inevitably going to come those challenging times, you know, divorces happen. Um, addiction takes place, medical issues, uh, loss of a job. Like these things are going to happen and it's, it's hard and difficult when they do. But if I can help a man be a little bit more resilient than maybe I've been in the past or use some of my own painful experiences to help somebody be a little bit more resilient and come out the other side of these challenging circumstances unscathed, then I feel like we're doing work worthwhile. Do you think uh, so? How put put me back, take me back to the beginning, put me in your shoes a, as a kid, and and you know because you talk about like I said in your very first episode about you know having a, a father that really struggled with a lot of this stuff, you know that yeah. th- and and you, and you're complimentary to your mom. Obviously, she was a strong, extraordinary woman who did everything she could to raise a, a great son and a great daughter. And right. how when you. Do, do your experiences of all of that as a kid, and, and, and obviously it shaped the man that you become today, but do you think about that with regards to raising your own children? Yeah, it's interesting. If, if my father was in my life as a permanent fixture, would my life look different? Would I be a different man? Would I be a better man? I, I'm not actually sure if I, could, if I can unequivocally say yes, that I would be better had my father been around. I, I don't know the answer to that. How could we? And that's exactly what that's exactly what I'm getting at. Yeah. You know, I, I look at so I look at my experience and just to give some context and shape to the conversation. 9-11 was one of the most horrific experiences, you know, terrorist attack, the likes of which this country's never had to endure before. Right. Um, it changed the trajectory of this country with regards to how we look at foreign policy, with how we evaluate threats. I mean, it spawned this whole Department of Homeland Security, the concept of Homeland Security, um, it, you know, and obviously altered the trajectory of my life, Ryan. A horrible event. Right. Yeah, but right. I look back on that and I say, well, you know what? That horrible event led me to join the army, introduced me some of them to the some of the most amazing men uh, that I've ever met in my life. You know, I went to Afghanistan and war sucks. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know oh, yeah. that. No doubt. Um, but I wouldn't change those experiences for anything. You know, well, Came here's what I would say, though, Sean, to that is that in this instance, the exceptions don't disprove the rule. And I don't think I, I won't say it. I won't say that a man who grows up without a father who is successful in his own right is uncommon. I don't think that it's uncommon. I think it's fairly common. Uh, there's, there's plenty of men that I've talked with. Some of the most successful men on the planet grew up without a father figure in the planet, in, in the household. So can we say that, uh, he would be better off with a father, but here's what I do know. If you look at the statistics, the rate of drug use, the rate of, uh, depression and suicide, uh, gang activity, criminal activity, if you look at the, the rates of those types of behaviors and activities for, for boys who don't have fathers in the homes, they are significantly increased. And that's just the statistics. That's the data. So we can pour over the data. We can look at drug abuse. We can look at mental health and mental illness. We can look at criminal activity. We can look at suicide and know that having a father in the home is better than not. Now, whenever I say that, guys will say, well, but if the father is abusive, <laughs> right. Like, I don't need to spell all of this out. Of course, if the father is physically or verbally or mentally or emotionally abusive uh, or introducing their son to things he should not be injured, of course, that's, that's a problem. When I say having a father in the home, what I mean by that is an engaged, loving, caring, masculine presence that will help our young men understand what they're feeling, what they're experiencing, what they're going through, what their hormones are doing to them, how it's causing them to behave and then learning how to harness all of that masculine energy into productive outcomes for themselves and the people that they care about. And that's what I would call manliness. Hmm. Man, I, 
I mean, to me, this, this is so powerful for a lot of different reasons. And, you know, I've been on your show a couple of times now. Yeah. Um, and I'll tell you my own personal experience with this is, you know, I've, I've, I've known you for a while. I said to myself, well, you know, what is, you know, I know what it means to be a man. You know, I've done some tough shit. I've been to war. I've led men in combat. You know, I'm a father. I think I'm a good involved father. That's something sure. that's important to me. You know, something that el something else that's important to me is I'll be in a good involved husband and making those little improvements every day and seeing every day as an opportunity to improve and better yourself. Right. Right. But what I didn't realize through all of that rationalization in my own head was how desperately I, I needed it. And when you start asking deep and profound questions about what does it mean to be a man, you know, or, or when you, you, you've got an article out there or uh, something that you, on, you wrote in your blog about boys need fathers or boys need dads. Sure. And unequivocally, that is true, right? But oftentimes in our lives, we almost take that for granted. So what is it? What so what does it mean? Like what do boys need from fathers? What does it mean for me to be a good man? You know, what does it mean for me to be a good husband? And what I realize on on your show is that you 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 ask these what are very general questions, right? That can have profound implications in our lives. And most of the time I think people gloss over them. You know, I because do. you're so busy with life, life happens, you know, and you know that you're a husband, you know that you're a father, but maybe you don't, I, I was talking to Melanie about this today. Like, I don't think I've ever asked myself, even though I do think I'm a good dad. I love my kids. I want to be involved in their lives. I'm fit, willing, and able, and I like hanging out with them, but I've never really asked what, what exactly do my boys need from me? Yeah, there's a great quote by Marcus Aurelius that says, waste no more time arguing what a man should be, just be one, right? I'm paraphrasing a little bit, so I, I may have butchered that, but that's the gist of it. So it might be easy to assume that we all know what it means to be a man, and the only reason we believe that is because we, blew up, we grew up excuse me, in certain constraints and certain stories and narratives and experiences and cultures and religious practices that shaped our view of manliness, so you think you have it figured out until you don't, that's right where it gets you, you know, and I, exactly. I can even tell, I can tell you and I, and I actually, we've had phone calls about this. I've, I've had my, uh, my challenges with alcoholism over the past couple of years. I've been sober for the last six months now, which I feel really good and, and I'm proud about. And obviously I'm showing up in better ways for my children and my wife. And obviously within my business, uh, I thought I had everything figured out until I had some conversations with some people very close to me that made me realize, holy shit, Ryan, you don't have things figured out. You may know a textbook answer about what it means to be a man, but are you actually being one? And truth is I wasn't being as much of a man as I could have been. That's the reality. You know, I, I, I feel like I want to do right. I feel like I want to do good. Um, I want to show up in powerful ways, but I wasn't showing up the way that I could fully show up until I was, presented with this, you know, kick in the nuts. And I realized I had a long way to go. And so for me personally, here's what I'll share for me personally, that began with putting the booze down. Like just, you got, you got to put the alcohol away because it changes you. It changes who you are. It changes how you show up. My wife and kids have told me stories about certain experiences where I was drunk, where I, now six months sober, I'm like, what? Like, that's what I said. That's what I did. That doesn't even sound like me. And alcohol changed me. And, uh, you know, my wife said something pretty, pretty telling to me the other day. She said, you know, you came back, you came back. And so substance abuse is a real issue for men. And I've explored why that is. And I'm still trying to get to the root of why I turned to alcoholism, but there were some things from my past that I don't want to make sound bigger than they are because I know there's men that have de dealt with significantly more challenging issues than I have. I'm talking about physical and sexual abuse, none of which I was subject to when I was younger, fortunately. But I, I really have some anger issues. I really have some patience issues. I really have a, a desire to control people because I have some abandonment issues. Like there's things I didn't even realize I had going on. And it wasn't until I put the booze away and started to do some of this deeper work about 
Where does my anger stem from? Uh, why am I trying to run away? And what am I trying to run away from? And these are conversations that men aren't having in their own minds or journaling, and they're also not having them with other men, which is interesting because the more... So I'll give you one more story here. When I told, when I decided I wanted to tell some people about what I was dealing with, with my alcoholism, uh, it was for our iron council, which is our, our, uh, our band of brothers, so to speak. It's a, it's a mastermind type group within our organization. And I decided I would let them know first. And I recorded a video and told these guys. And when I made the decision, I was pretty convinced that there was going to be a mass exodus from the iron council. I mean, I had fully convinced myself that these guys, I'm going to undermine my, my credibility and my authority with these guys. And they're going to think I'm a fraud and a hypocrite. And maybe some of that I was, and they're gone. But I decided, you know what? I really want to get an integrity. And if I want to be an integrity, I can't really worry about the result of doing the right thing. Doing the right thing is the right thing to do regardless of the outcome. So I made the decision to tell these guys via video. And the exact opposite of what I thought would happen is what actually happened. The men didn't leave. There was a handful of guys who did, and they were upset. And some of them had their own personal reasons for being upset. Their fathers were alcoholics, and they never came to terms with that. And so that kind of got piled onto me, which is understandable. But the overwhelming majority, I'm talking 99.9% .9 of these guys were supportive, positive, and I was flooded with messages. Ryan, thank you so much for sharing. I've dealt with alcoholism for years. I've been struggling with this. I've been hiding this from my wife. I've been hiding this from my kids. It's been affecting my business. It's been affecting my health. And now because I was actually willing to share some really vulnerable struggles of my own, it gave other men permission to share some of theirs. And men just aren't having these conversations, which is why we bottle it up. We shove down the emotions. We don't address the things that we're really dealing with. And then it comes out in... In the best case scenario, it comes out in unproductive ways. In worst case, it could come out in violent and dangerous ways. Hmm. I mean, you talked about drinking and there's so much here, Ryan. I mean, I think that drinking is a way for, you know, people, but but men to to obliterate any sort of thought or reflection on certain problems that we face. Yeah. And 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 that's just how we you know, we talk about self-medicating, but that's just how we ignore it. And right. when we ignore deep seated existential life issues, they can manifest in, into things that aren't great. And how much though, does, does society, how much is society to blame for this, Ryan? Because over the years, like we've been inundated with, you know, fathers who are betrayed and even sitcoms as a buffoonish, aloof father who's uninvolved and is just maybe a, a laughing, you know, someone who someone who's laughed at, you know, sure. um, it, it does, does this this sort of war on masculinity in our culture today where it's confusing for, for boys to, to muddle through life to try to figure out what it means to be a man. There's no doubt. Yeah. And there are so many influence points. Um, in in our kids' lives and in the lives of even you know adolescents who are becoming men, where they're they're being influenced from a thousand different directions, and maybe we're not as parents or as fathers, we're not aware of what our kids are watching, so we don't know the kind of person that they're becoming. H how does society play a role in men feeling scared to? feel vulnerable and actually have these important conversations? Well, the, the short answer is yes, but what does, what is society comprised of millions and well, billions of individuals. So the short answer is yes, society plays a factor, but the individual is just as culpable. <laughs> like if, if we as men show up in more powerful ways for ourselves and then we work as it, within the, uh, where we have the most sphere of influence. So that would be ourselves, right? We can completely control how we show up and behave and how we think. And then it gravitates and it, and it migrates and gets bigger from there into your family, your wife and your children. Cannot completely control them, but certainly have the most influence over them relative to anybody else. Then it gets to your colleagues and your co coworkers and your employees. 
Uh, then it gets to community members. Then it gets to state. Then it gets to, you know, the federal level. But yeah, it, 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 it both does and doesn't matter. And let me explain what I mean by that. When we say that society paints men as bumbling buffoons and unnecessary and toxic masculinity, when I say it doesn't matter, what I mean by that is doesn't matter how society collectively paints men. Here's how I am going to show up. I am going to show up in this way, even if it is at odds with what I would call the doctrine of popular culture would suggest. That's where it doesn't matter. Where it does matter is one of the questions that I get probably daily at this point is what can we as men do to change the tide of culture? And the answer is change yourself. Now, I know that's not the silver bullet. Um, I know that's not the magical phrase that you're looking for. I, there's no button I can go hit on a wall that changes you know, culture or society. But if you do it, then you're going to teach your son or sons to do it. If you do it, then your coworker who really looks up to you is going to change as a result of the way that you show up. If you do it and you're serving on your school board, you're going to start to influence other school board members. So we need to change ourselves first and we need to start enlisting the men around us. If I can change and I can change five or six guys around me and they can change five or six guys around them and somebody like me and you who can literally change the thought process and the perception and action of, of thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of people because of the platforms that we've built. How amazing is that? It doesn't happen overnight, but we need to reject the doctrine of popular culture and we now need to replace it and infuse it with something better. A great example of that is the public school system. We need to reject what the public school system is teaching. Now, it's not enough to say, I don't agree with society and culture, but let me go send my four kids to be shepherded by these woke, horrible individuals. Like I'm like, wait, do you really not like, like what? It, like, let's really test what you're saying here. You say you don't want your children to be indoctrinated by the doctrine of popular culture. And yet you ship your kids to school for five days a week, <laughs> eight hours every day. Well, right. Yeah. It's hard. No shit. It's hard. Of course it's hard. My wife and I, we homeschool our children and it's hard. You know, they're downstairs and, and I can see when my wife's working with them, I can see the frustration that she has when one of the kids don't get something, you know, she could probably go out into the workforce and double our, our household income. Like there's a lot of things that are harder, but we don't believe in sending our kids to public school. So is that just lip service or do we genuinely mean that? And if we genuinely mean what we, what we say, like, oh, the school system's horrible, then you're not going to send your kids to the school system. You're just not going to do it. That's a that's a, an example of what I mean. It's going to take sacrifice and work to make change. Oh, you're not you're not kidding, you know. And because look, society when you talk about it being hard, like yeah, it is, it is. And I'll give you I'll give you a personal example of what I mean, Ryan. And I really haven't talked about this at all. Um, but you know, when I came back from Afghanistan, you know, when you come back from war, you struggle. I mean, war changes you. Um, I don't necessarily look at that experience as a negative in, in a negative light, right? Like I try to come at those life experiences saying, Hey, look, so sometimes in life you have good experiences, you have bad experiences. It's up to us to, to, to implement them or it's, it's up to us and how we respond. Right. And so part of, part of the way that I responded to coming back from Afghanistan was throwing myself into helping other veterans, men and women who've come home from war, help them come back, not just to live in society, not just to survive, but to thrive. And part of the way that I did that was showing vulnerability, because I think leaders have to show vulnerability every now and again um, to inspire the people that have chosen to follow. And yes. one of the ways that I did that, I said, you know, look, I, I'm, I came back from war. I struggled. It hasn't been easy. I got help when I came out to help me at least order my thoughts, you know, and you should too, right? If, 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 you know, and you know how tough that is in the military, right? When, especially in, in, in the infantry where you're expected to handle horrific things and endure and not show any weakness or any pain at all, right? And 
So if you want your soldiers to go get help, you as a leader have to say, hey, I did it too. You can do it. Right. And I use I built a, a charity and a platform on that. Like I suffered. I've struggled. You should seek help. And then I find myself in a family court system, really, which if you're a man and you find yourself trapped in the family court system, it really is David versus Goliath on a lot of different ways. And I yeah. went into that family court system and I had that weaponized against me. You're too broken. You're too fragile to have your own children. And so when you talk about being the change that you want to see in the world, society can really... <laughs> Really, I mean, you can get punished for that in a lot of ways. And I, I I see how men sometimes, Ryan, because now that I've been listening to your podcast, I'm super interested in 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 making better men and raising better boys and just not boys, just children. But I can see and understand why men would not ever want to talk about any of their problems, not show any sort of vulnerability. But that catalyst for change and really growing into better people is being able to talk about some of the life struggles that you've had with other men to get better, you know, well, it's um, good for us. I mean, it's therapeutic. You know, I know, I know I always feel better when I talk about these things, you know, whether it's alcoholism or relationship issues or whatever it might be, you know, I might not even come to some conclusion or some answer to my biggest problems, but just being able to hash some of these out with guys who have been through similar experiences is helpful. But then again, like I said earlier, it gives other men a permission slip to do the same. And we do need, they don't need permission, but in a way they're waiting for it. And so if they're waiting for it and I can help be that catalyst for change, what right do I have to deny them my experience? Yeah. Well, what do you, so what do you make of, you know, I don't know. I didn't watch the Grammys. I didn't see anything about, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't watch it live, but you see the way that pop culture influences our kids and the way that celebrities influence our, our children. And like, you know, I, I shared this, like almost like this satanic <laughs> it seemed like it was some damn satanic ritual. It, I saw it, it. Yeah. And it, I mean, like, I thought like there's something, first of all, I think that that's boring. I don't think that there's anything edgy about, you know, being say satanic or, or I don't think there's anything creative about it. It's especially pretty safe in this day and age. It's pretty safe. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. But there was also something to me that just didn't sit right. I mean, I'm a Catholic, you know, I'm, I'm not like, you know, I'm, I'm a spiritual person. I believe in a higher power. Um, and you talk about, you know, with regards to the order of man and the movement that you built faith, not necessarily a specific religious faith, but faith in something greater than ourselves. Sure. You know, I believe in God and there's just something very wrong with a society that feels comfortable with grandiose pomp and circumstance of throwing, like basically giving the finger to that higher power. And, you know, I, I shared that right. Like on, on Instagram and some people were like, well, why are you sharing it? Other people yeah. see this and now they're watching it. Yeah. But the thing is, is that like, that is true. And I understand that, but our children sometimes are watching this, you know, they're they They, they look at, they listen to this music. They idolize these people, Ryan. And, Oftentimes I find myself asking the question, how influenced by these people are they? Right. And how much, what's my role as a father in giving a different perspective to my children? So I've thought that too. I have conflicting thoughts. I saw this, this uh, performance, so to speak, <laughs> that you're, you're suggesting. And I've thought the same thing. You know, people share these horrific things or these really outlandish social uh, issues and it's like, okay, yeah, you're just, you're just giving credence to the, uh, to, to that side of the, the <laughs> equation. So the alternative is then to what ignore it. Right. But if you ignore it, like that's not going to solve any issues. So there, there has to be a response and, and I'm using that word very carefully. You do have to respond as men. We are called to respond. We don't complain about things and then just end it. We don't gripe and moan and bitch about things that we don't like or that are inconvenient for us, or we think are a danger or a threat to our emotional, physical, mental, spiritual well-being. We don't just complain, we respond. So we see issues with the world, and then we do something about it. So when it comes to entertainment and media and all of these other things that are actively working against our best interest, 
then it's our job to respond by drawing attention to the issue. And then this is where most people stop coming up with something better, coming up with something better. So for example, if I don't want my children to be influenced by what's happening at the Grammys, then I probably ought to be doing something else with my children during that time. Like what? You don't want them to be influenced by that music. You don't want them to be influenced by entertainment or that culture. Then what are you doing instead? And I'll tell you what we were doing this last weekend. We weren't watching the Grammys. We were in Salt Lake at the Western Hunt Expo, and we were visiting with friends. We were uh, networking. We were forming connections with people that we just met, people that we haven't seen for a long time. We went and did jujitsu one night, and we called up friends and had dinner every night that we were there, and we were out actively building connections with good and wholesome people to expand our network. We had a couple of opportunities come up to go hunting later in the year, one in Africa, uh, and then another friend that we asked if he would come hunting with us. Like we're out building these connections while other people are just zombied out like a vegetable on the couch watching the Grammys being indoctrinated even subconsciously by this bull crap. So don't pretend like you care if you're not willing to replace what you see wrong with something that's better. Wow. That's, uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's powerful, man. And I think it, the war is real. The cultural, the spiritual war is, is real. It and is. It's real. And, and once you see it, you can't unsee it. And, and just today, you know, S- Senator Daines from Montana, you, I don't know if you know him, he's the chair of the National Republican Senatorial Committee. He had his Twitter account suspended because he's a picture with his wife on a hunt, you know, and ridiculous. it's it is it is. And it just seems like the deck in this country is so stacked against you know, the traditional nuclear family and, and, and the, the kitchen table issues that most, that matter to most Americans, you know, the cost uh, of what, what things are at the grocery store or raising your children to understand, you know, that it's important to get good grades and what it means to lead and how to treat people right. It seems like everything in our culture is diametrically opposed to that. Well, take that example, Sean, of, of food at the grocery store and inflation and these things we see. We see the big deal with eggs and everything else. Okay, so that's a problem, right? Everybody's identified. That's a problem. That's an issue. Show me your chickens. Well, I don't have, I don't have chickens. Why? Well, I, I don't know. They're hard to take care of and I, my HOA or what. Okay, <laughs> then you're not dealing with the problem. Like you're... Oh man, I hate I hate living in a in in this you know this concrete jungle and we're just stacked on top of each other. Okay, show me the offer that you made on the house that gives you you know a few acres and and moving into the suburbs. Oh well, you know I can't do that because uh, my job and this and okay, then stop complaining about it. Like I'm not going to fault you if if you say, hey, you know I like living here, I like doing this, this is my lifestyle, I don't see anything thing wrong with it. All the power to you. But if you're complaining about it. Show me what you're doing about it. If you're worried about food prices, show me your hunter's ed certificate. Well, I'm busy. Okay, then you don't care about it. That's it. Like, or, or if you're complaining about food prices, let me see your garden that you grow every year. Oh, I don't, I don't grow a garden. I don't really know where to start. And I don't really... Bro, you can jump on YouTube and you can learn how to plant tomatoes in like 30 <laughs> seconds. Okay, stop complaining If you're not going to do anything about it, that is my message of today. And that will be my message forever. I try not to complain unless I'm willing to do something about it. We were talking about United. I had a bad flight with United. (laughs) What what are you going to do about it? Well, I'll tell you one thing I'm not, I'm going to do is I'm not going to book with United next time. Like I'm just not going to fly with them. Like that, that's doing something. That's a response. But some people don't even do that. Oh, well, United has the best flight or the best price, or, you know, it gets me there at the right time. Okay, then you don't care about the issue, and that's fine. But don't pretend like you do if you're not willing to do anything about it. So, so a couple of things, just for people who are listening and and p- perhaps watching this, you know, I'm hearing like I'm, I'm taking lots of lessons from this, right? Like, be the change that you want to see in the world, live the change that you want to make in the world, right? Uh, but also, when you say be a man of action, is this what you mean? A hundred percent. You know, it's easy to get on social media and complain about everything that's wrong. It's harder to sacrifice. You know, again, I'll go back to homeschooling. I know of so many families that want to homeschool, and I know of quite a few 
who are making some real sacrifices. They're selling extra vehicles. They're starting to learn how to budget more effectively. They're getting rid of uh, subscriptions like Disney Plus and this, you know, this, this nonsense that they are subscribed to and they're saving money so they can bring their wife home and she can homeschool the kids and she can finally step into what a lot of women have actually wanted to do since they were girls, but society said, don't talk about it. You know, when I tell people that my wife is a homemaker and, and a housewife, that that's frown. Like so many people frown upon that. I'm like, what? Is, what? It, Ryan, it is so true. It's horrible. It, and it is by far the most important job. I mean, one of the most important jobs in the world. And, and, and look, I'm not saying that, you know, it's not okay for a woman to go out and work. I mean, obviously we all have to chart our own path, but I don't like the derision that women face when they say they've made it, that, that the path that they see in their lives for them, that makes the most sense for them is raising good children and being in the home and, and, and helping lead because that is a very, very difficult, thankless job. And, you know, I, I, it, it, it upsets me when people look at, look down on women for, for making that decision. Yeah. It's very frustrating. And and you said it, you said it well is uh, there's plenty of women, millions of women who want to go into the, into the workforce and chart, chart their path that way. And that's fine. You know, I'm never going to mock a woman who goes into the workforce and decides that she wants to become an attorney or a CEO or start a business or become a school teacher or whatever. That's all great. I think it's noble. I think it's ambitious. And I think if a woman's interested in doing that, she should, I would, I would have her consider the ramifications and the sacrifices of doing that. But if she's considered that, then by all the power to her, I would never mock her for doing that. And yet there's a side of the equation, the social equation where they will literally mock a woman for deciding to stay at home. They'll say, Oh, you're just, you know, that your husband's trying to keep you under his thumb or you just, he just wants you to be barefoot and pregnant. It's like, what a horrible, horrible way to treat our mothers who want to be engaged, who want to be loving, who want to be nurturing, who want to raise their kids in righteousness. We need more of that, not less of that. And we could certainly do without the mockery from both men and women for women who decide to stay at home and raise their families there. So talk, talk to me about, talk to me about that. Talk to me about raising, raising kids. And when you, what is at the forefront of your mind? Because you, you've got, you've got boys and you've got girls, right? You've got, sure. you've got what you've got, you don't talk about your daughter that much. And I, I know don't. why, but, by design, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, by design. So yeah. I don't want to go too far into that, no, but you, you, you've got both. My point is you have both boys and you have, you have, you have sons and daughters, right? Correct. So three sons and a, and a girl and a daughter, three sons and a, and, and a daughter. What is at the forefront of your mind? Because the order of man is not just about being a good man, being good men, but it's also yes. about being a good husband, being a good spouse, being a good father. What's at the forefront of your mind when you're raising your children? My, so this is my mindset and then we can get into the specifics and you know, again, I'm trying to figure it out. I, my oldest is 14. <laughs> my youngest is six and they're all different. You so say I, you've got, you've, you're like running the gauntlet every yeah. day, 14 to six. Yeah. And the minute I think I have something figured out, one of my kids throws a curveball at me and I'm like, I don't know how to deal with that. And I take the best swing I can. <laughs> Sometimes I, I connect and other times I just strike out miserably. But there is a, there's my motto is this. My job is to render myself obsolete. That's my job as a father, period, is to render myself obsolete, is to put myself out of work. If I have to be needed in perpetuity by my children for all of their daily needs and support and comfort and all of this kind of stuff, then I'm not doing my job. Now, granted, I understand that the relationship will change over time. When my son, my oldest son, who's 14 now, graduates in the next four years, I realize that the dynamic between us will change. I will never be completely obsolete, at least I hope not, but the dynamic will change. But the motto is render yourself obsolete, meaning put yourself out of work. We need to train our children and teach them in a way that allows them to have capabilities, mindsets, skill sets that they can go out into the world and tackle whatever life has to throw at them, regardless of whether or not we're supporting them. I hate to see a young man who's 25 years old and he's still living with his mom and his dad. I hate to see that because he's limiting his potential. He's limiting the potential to other people around him if he were to actually go out and assert himself. And it's his parents' fault. 
That's the thing. It's his parents' fault for not teaching him what he needed to know. When I graduated, which was in 1999, I graduated high school. And uh, wait, how? Up, wait, you're a year older than me. I'm I graduated 41. in two. I graduated in 2000. You did, yeah. Yeah, I thought that you were way younger than no, me. No, I'm I'm 41. <laughs> me that's too. What, me yeah, too. that's interesting. You thought I was older. I thought you were younger. Oh, younger. Yeah, no, yeah, I'm, I'm I thought 41. you were younger. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Go All ahead. Good. So yeah, when I graduated, um, we went on our senior trip, which is to Southern California for, I think there was, you know, 20 of us or whatever. And I came back, I came back the next day I moved out and it wasn't because I hated my mom or we had bad or bad relationship or there was animosity or contention. It was none of that. It was, she did a pretty damn good job raising me to be independent. And I felt like, Hey, I'm ready to go out and do this. I'm ready to go out and tackle this. And that's exactly what I did for better or worse. You know, I've had, I've had a lot of mistakes along the way, but I never went home. My mom and I still have a great relationship, but I never went home because that's not my role. Now my role is to go out and build my own kingdom, make myself my own man. And then of course, raise a family and do the same with them. Do you talk to your kids about, the mistakes that you've made in, in your life leading. Uh, I mean, cause obviously, you know, when you're, when you build your own kingdom, I mean, there are battles to be fought at, in, in that process. You win some, you lose some. Uh, do you talk to your children about those mistakes? Yeah. I mean, again, that's part of rendering yourself obsolete. You know, if you, it, I want them to learn from my mistakes, I don't want them to make the same mistakes, Yeah. <laughs> but if I'm not willing to share those things, how easy would it be for my sons and my daughter to slip into alcohol abuse? Probably a lot easier than somebody who have, who has never had to deal with that issue. You know, they're, they're, we know that they're even susceptible to it more so than, than other people because I am. So you better believe that I'm talking with them about it. And, you know, there's a beauty in that. And I'll tell you what it is. It's hard because you have to tell your kids you're not as great as they may think you are, and they do. Uh, and so my, my two oldest boys know about my alcohol abuse. My two youngest don't because it's not appropriate at the age they're at right now. But as they get older, we will have those discussions. Some of the hardest things were for me to have to share that with them. And it may have devalued or I'm trying to think about the right way to say it. it may have deflated the way they feel about me. It may have not knocked me down a notch or two, but you know what? That's more important to me than hiding it and pretending it doesn't exist and them having to learn those mistakes on their own. But what they're going to see now is they're going to see a man who's fall, fallen and they're going to see him get up, dust himself off, stand up and get back in the fight a better man than he was before. And they're going to witness that in real time, which is going to be a very, very powerful lesson for them. I think so too. I mean, so because life is inherently imperfect. Yes. You know, I tell my, my kids, you know, look like life, if you, life is like a book, you know, beginning, middle and an end. Right. Um, some of the chapters of that book are good. Some probably not so much, but it's your job to turn the pages as enthusiastically and vigorously as possible and learn lessons along the way. Some chapters are going to be pretty shitty. Um, but that's just life. I think it's important for, I mean, we talk about like, so much of what we're talking about, Ryan, is is men ta like being open, upfront and honest, almost vulnerable. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean crying in your beer all the time and 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 playing, you know, the victim card or woe is me, like because you're talking about being vulnerable but a critical component of that is also being a man of action right so being a man of action like you're not crying in your beer you're you're not just complaining without a way to make the situation better right so two of those things seem like a major theme of of what you're talking about and well, there there's let's talk about vulnerability for a minute because there is a big movement in society to be vulnerable yes and, and what yes. i see all too often is it's vulnerable for the sake of being vulnerable. And then you win points for being vulnerable, but let's, let's use, the, <laughs> let's use the, the, the military. I mean, you and I are both in the military and both served. We had vulnerabilities in our defense, for example, whether it was base defense or, or the way that, you know, if we're talking about a thousand or 2000 years ago, maybe there was a weakness in the wall of, of, of the castle, right? That was a vulnerability. 
And we actively look for those vulnerabilities in the military. Okay, where are we weak? Where are we susceptible? Where are we vulnerable? And we do that for one reason alone. It's not to cry about it. It's not to complain about it. It's not to wallow in it. It's to fix it, right? It's to recognize that our defenses are weak right there. Maybe we ought to put different troops there. Maybe we ought to, ought to spend some time building up that wall. Maybe we ought to fortify that position. But the, the point of being vulnerable is to expose weaknesses in order to address them. But modern culture is, no, just be vulnerable and cry and, you know, <laughs> all over yourself and babble like a buffoon. Like, that's not it. The answer is, hey, you know what? Alcoholism. That's a vulnerability. That's, that's a weakness of mine. And so I need to put some systems and processes in place to keep myself from that temptation. One is we don't have alcohol in the house. Another one is I got to avoid the stores where I would go to get drinks. Like there's a lot of things that I put in place to shore up my vulnerabilities. That's the complete package, not just the first half of it. I was so glad that you that you differentiated that because so much of, oh, let's men need to be more vulnerable or people need to be more vulnerable. It's just straight up virtue signaling bullshit without yes, most the, the action step to shore up what you're vulnerable about, vulnerable about in the first place to make yourself better. And, and on that note, when um, I, if I can just interrupt real quick. Sure. I, so when I started talking with my guys about this, this um, alcohol abuse, it was months after I had gotten sober. And I didn't, it wasn't the first thing I did is I went and told them, Hey, I'm an alcoholic. Like I, here's me. That wasn't the first thing I did. The first thing I did was I stopped drinking for a couple of months and I started going to meetings and I started to put the systems in place and I got myself clean and sober. And then I went to them and I did that because I didn't feel right going to them and complaining about something that was a struggle in my life that I wasn't actively working on fixing in the, in the moment. So I wanted to have a couple of months under my belt of clear actions that I had taken to get me to the point where I was sober so that when I went and told them, I was able to say, guys, look, this is an issue I deal with. This is something I've been struggling with for a couple of years, and here's how I'm fixing it, and here's the path that I'm on right now, and here's what I'm doing. It's a much more powerful position than simply complaining and crying about things that are wrong in your life. I agree. I mean, so let's talk about that for a second. Today, you you put something out about the importance of routines and the power that routines can have in our lives. Um, you were away for a while. You got back to the gym, back in your routine. You said you feel better. Um, it's funny that you put – it's funny and, and also slightly ironic that you put that out because I, I think about – I had just been thinking about the power of routines, mm -hmm. at, both as being like a, a professional husband, father. Um, routines can also be bad, right? Unhealthy. Of course. And drinking might be one of them, right? right? When you look at like, hey, I live, hey, look, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to wake up in the morning. I'm going to take the kids to school. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to come back. I'm going to read, write, reflect, journal. And then I'm going to work my ass off at whatever mission that I put myself behind that day. And then I'm going to put my phone down. We're going to have dinner together as a family. I'm going to talk to talk to the kids, be present for the kids, be present for my wife. And then you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to pour a drink. Right. And that's just in, in that routine of pouring a drink as innocuous and as benign as it might seem, if that if you're a routine person. Right. So you just having a drink, one drink every night, every night, every night, every night, might be the, maybe that becomes two. It can become a an unhealthy routine pretty quickly. Yeah. Right. We uh, we as humans get really good at the things that we practice. So mm. if you practice drinking as I was, I was getting really, really good at it, <laughs> you know, and then I was getting, and then I didn't want people to know cause I was ashamed. And so I started to get pretty good at hiding it, which only exacerbated the problem because the people closest in my life didn't know the full weight of what I was dealing with. Therefore they couldn't help me tackle it because I was hiding it. Like these are the, and the, here's the interesting thing about negative routines. We know when we're doing something we shouldn't be doing, maybe it's gambling, maybe it's womanizing, maybe it's pornography, maybe it's drug or alcohol addiction. We know, and yet we still do it. Why do we do it when we know it's bad? Because we're getting something from it. Like there's some benefit from it. I love drinking because I could tune out and not have to worry about anything challenging for several hours, right? And I, when I stopped drinking, I reclaimed three to four hours a day. I hate to admit that, but three to four hours a day 
when I was either drunk, getting drunk, or with a hangover, passed out or a hangover. Three to four hours every single day that I recaptured. And at first it was challenging because I had to figure out what to fill that time with. <laughs> yeah. what, what do I do? And so there was a big list of projects around the house I wanted to get done. <laughs> and my business became a lot more efficient and productive. And I was able to spend more time with my kids. But yeah, routines can make or break you, you know, and, and you ought to evaluate your routine and ask yourself if it's something you know you shouldn't be doing. The first step is to ask yourself, what are you getting out of it? And for me, it was getting out of having to address hard and challenging emotions that I was dealing with. Well, how, well, how did you break it? How did you? Because, you know, it's, it's not easy to, to break a routine. It's not easy to start a routine either. You know, if it's, if you're out of shape and you're trying to go to the gym, um, there are probably a thousand and one reasons why you would avoid going to the gym. Oh, it's not convenient. I don't like the, I don't like the feeling of the gym. I'm not comfortable there. I don't know how to do the exercises. How people look at me weird, whatever. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to start, but once you get going and once you're in a routine, you feel good about it. Maybe it's hard to stop. How did you, how did you break that routine of drinking more than you would like? How did you, how did you stop doing that? Well, I'll, okay, so I'm going to challenge a little bit of what you said. You said it's hard to start something else or stop something. It's actually not. It's, it's really not. And, and I think we need to be careful of continuing to paint things as challenging when they're not. Like if you make a decision, make a decision. It's not as hard as you're making out to be. And what I think we do when we say it's hard is we're already giving our self excuses to slip. So we got to get rid of that. Now, I will say it's more challenging to maintain it. Cause look, everybody's stopped drinking. Like I stopped drinking every single day. I stopped drinking every day. I stopped drinking and then I would start back up the next day. So it's not, it's not hard to stop. Interesting. Right? Interesting. Yeah. It's hard to sustain it past that critical point. And there is a critical point where it's like, I got this now I'm into a new routine routine. And I don't know what it is, but I can tell you that for me, it's a routine when it feels foreign not to do it. Like, I don't know if it's 21 days to a routine or 30 days. I don't know what the magic number is. I just know that I feel a little bit off when I don't do it. So going to the gym wasn't something I was regularly doing, but I've noticed that over the past, I would say about eight weeks now, very, very consistent. I'm talking six days a week without exception, even on vacation. This last trip on Salt Lake, uh, I missed one of my workouts and it felt weird. I felt off. And that to me indicated that it was a routine. But to answer your question about how do you, how did I stop? Here's how you stop. When the pain of, of stopping, or let me say it this way. When the pain of continuing is greater than the discomfort of stopping. When the pain of continuing, and I'm, when I'm talking about pain, I'm talking about the consequences of it. You know, losing loved ones. Uh, potentially getting loved ones hurt or even yourself hurt when the pain of that is greater than the challenge and the struggle and adversity of not engaging in that behavior. And the, the pain became so great through some conversations that I had that I realized, oh boy, this is more serious than I thought. And I think changing is going to be easier than dealing with the pain of continuing this behavior. I mean, was the, was changing easier for you? Looking at it now with being sober. Yes. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Um, even if, even if things don't work out the way that you want engaging in the right behavior, or in this case, disengaging in incorrect behavior is 100% always the right thing to do. And so my life moving forward will be infinitely better and probably longer. I probably mm -hmm. won't be dead and get people killed in the meantime. I mean, I think it's, it's fascinating when, you know, you talk about routines and, and it really not being challenging to start something, right? You just sure. do it. 
you don't allow yourself to have a mental dialogue or a fight internally about whether or not you're going to do something. Be decisive. Just do it. And then once you commit to it, don't stop. Well, I would say, and, Sean, on that one thing is, you know how we often fight against the things we know we should be doing? Why not instead yeah. decide to fight, but fight for the right things? So if I'm if I get up in the morning and I want to sleep in, I will start to fight about sleeping in like, Oh, I deserve it. I just got back off vacation and now I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm busy today and I got catch up and you know, I haven't seen my kid. Like those are the things I'm fighting not to engage in behavior. I want to, well, why not just fight for the right behavior? So instead of fighting against it, say, you know what? I should go to the gym because it makes me a better father. I should go to the gym because I know when I'm done, I feel better. I should go because I like to put a little check mark in my daily task that makes me know that I actually did something. I should do it because I like the way that I look when my shirt's off and I can see that my biceps are getting stronger. So I should do that. So you can keep fighting. Just fight for the behavior that you want to engage in or fight against the behavior you don't want to engage in. Just fight for something else. <laughs> it's it is it's so true, man. And it's like when you when you think about routines, like like for me, it's like I you know brush my teeth a couple times a day. I don't think about doing it. I just do it. It's become right. a part. I mean, you know, and it would so, be awkward if you didn't. It'd be it'd uncomfortable be, it'd be, <laughs> for know? both me and everybody and, else around me. Yeah, I mean, it's true. I want my routines to get like that, where I'm not even fighting. I'm just doing right. I'm not yeah. even having. You know. Um. So okay. So what is so what's next for? For Ryan Mickler, I know you've got the Masculine Manifesto. You've got the what's next for the Order of Man. You've got these retreats that you're doing now, um, and you've got this amazing community of, of hundreds of thousands of people now that that are a part of it. You talked about the importance of being a man of action, and you talked about the importance of deeds and not words. What's next for you? So I would love to have a good answer and say, we have all these amazing things coming up, but you know what? I, I mean, again, to be vulnerable and to address this, to make sure it serves other people, uh, the last six months have really, have really shown me that I built a lot of my life on sand, a faulty foundation. And for me, it's really about shoring that up first, like, you know, deconstructing a lot of what I've built, whether it's relationships or the business and not tearing them to the ground, just deconstructing, taking a look at where they need to be shored up, um, and then building the foundation. And for me, the foundation is built upon God, number one, and then upon my actions that are in alignment with, with his desires for me. So I, I can't say that I'm going to build this huge, you know, empire and I have this event and that event and this, I'm really in a stage right now of my life where I'm evaluating where the foundation is faulty and how I can shore that up because I know I can't go further with my relationships, with my business, with my health until I build up that foundation. So I'm very uh, spiritually centered right now, trying to be anyways, and trying to align my own behaviors and thoughts with that spiritual perspective. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's hard to serve others when your own life, and I'm not saying this about you is not an order. Right. Right. Or it right. might be in dis it's, it might be in disarray in some places and, and that those places need your attention more than looking outward. I had a, a mentor once say to me, he said, and this stuck with me forever and it's been so powerful. He said, Ryan, you'll be successful. Actually, let me give some context. When I was starting my financial services practice, but I was really, really struggling at the time. And I, the way I viewed myself was better than the way I was actually performing. So there was a a disparity between the way I saw my performance and what it was actually producing. And I just didn't know why I was struggling. I couldn't figure it out. And he came to me and he said, Ryan, you know, I know you want to be successful, but this is what you need to know. You'll be successful when you learn to light yourself on fire and allow other people to watch you burn. And that just, man, that just stuck with me forever. It's, it's not, it, it's about, for me anyways, about taking all of my life experiences and my challenges and my struggles and the things I'm doing well and, and lighting myself on fire, basically illuminating myself so that other people can watch, can learn, can, can be inspired by, can be motivated by, can see what they need to see in order to do the same thing in their lives. And that's how I view my responsibility with my children. You know, I got to illuminate everything about myself so they can see it 
and they can learn and they can grow from it. And that's where I'm at right now is I, I want to do that. I want to illuminate all of that, not only for my own growth, but for the benefit of other people. And no doubt uh, the order of man will benefit. The community that you've built will benefit 100%. from from that, from everything that you're doing now, building a stronger foundation, but also showing them how to do it, you know? Right. Um, and so, you know, I, I, like I said, I, I'm, I'm grateful that you've came on today. I want to be respectful of your time. I could talk to you all day, man. Um, well, likewise. But it, you know, if you're watching or you're listening, you know, go to the order of man.com, subscribe to what Ryan's doing, grab his book, the masculine manifesto. And if you feel so inclined, sign up for the iron council. It's really, really good stuff. It'll make your life better. It'll make you a better man, make you a better father, um, make you a better husband. Um, Ryan, thanks brother. I appreciate you being I appreciate here. You. you know, more so than that. And I want to, I do want to share this because I want people to know the kind of man you are is, you know, we've done, I think three or four podcasts now, including this one. Uh, but we've also had a bunch of conversations via text, via phone call. And I, obviously I'm not going to get into the private details of what the things I've shared with you. Cause that I want that to remain private, but I just want to tell you, I really appreciate your friendship. I know how busy you are. Um, I know how many people are probably clamoring for your attention and for you to be able to take time out and talk with me and, and, uh, counsel me, man, that really, really means a lot. So I, I appreciate our friendship and your guidance. Well, I appreciate our friendship very much as well. And uh, I, I look forward to continuing to build on it, man. And thank you all that you've for, for everything that you've done for me with this podcast. And yeah, yeah man, I'm cheers, brother. The podcast yeah. <laughs> is going to be awesome. I'm stoked for you. I can't wait to see what you do with this thing. Again, it's all about illuminating all of this stuff so it can serve other people. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. I appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Take care.